coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We visit with NCBA's president-elect and hear his thoughts on some of the top issues facing the beef industry. Plus, learn how John Deere equipment can help improve your former ranch's bottom line. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kate Maher. Being a leader in the nation's oldest and largest cattle industry organization takes dedication, as Don Schiefelbein has proven over the years. I recently caught up with the NCBA president-elect at his family's farm in Minnesota. Don, thanks for having us out today. It's a beautiful day to be here in Minnesota with black cattle grazing behind us. It is a gorgeous day, isn't it? It sure is. Hey, I want to ask you, uh, what are some of the wins that NCBA has worked on this year and had for the, for the beef producers in the industry? You know, it's interesting because some of the biggest wins are some of the things that don't happen. And so some of the things that didn't happen are the great wins this year. And one of those is capital gains. As you know, on some of these tax issues, which are, are a huge impact on our members in our industry, we were able to keep capital gains out of the equation. The estate tax we kept in bay. They even had a transfer tax going that they were thinking about applying to agricultural products. So I think the big win this year is making sure tax policy remain constant. Yeah, that can place such a burden on, on farmers and ranchers. Um, issues never stop coming, it seems like, and now we have a Waters of the U.S. rule that's being formed. We still have cattle markets to talk about. We have taxes to continue to talk about. What are some big issues coming up that producers really should stay engaged in um, and really engage in to make sure that we have a bigger voice fighting against these issues? Well, the Waters of the U.S. is a huge issue, and of course it affects almost everybody. And as you know, they're quickly, the Biden administration has quickly gone into offense and trying to make sure they go back the way it used to be. And after those big gains we made under the Trump administration, we certainly don't go, want to go backwards. So I encourage all our members to, put, to sign a petition, get on board, talk to their congressmen, and let them know that the way the Waters of the USA was written is the way it needs to stay. And we're really fortunate to have an office in Washington, D.C. with NCBA staff there working basically across all administrations. The issues don't change, the administrations do, but we're there all, those, all the way. And as you know, those subject matters come and go, and what we want is somebody who has our backs, right? And that's what Washington, D.C. NCBA does, is they have our backs. When we don't even know issues maybe are coming up, they're already killing them. And that's the important thing people need to remember is they're on our offense the whole time defending our backs. Shifting gears a little bit, I want to ask you, you're here at the family farm now, but you've had uh, quite a career in the beef industry uh, between breed associations, you've been involved with the Angus Association. As somebody who's been involved in a lot of aspects of the beef industry, and now you're going to be taking the reins as president of NCBA, why do you get involved? Why have you been involved throughout the years in, in the industry? Because there's a saying that we live by, it's where the industry goes, your business eventually goes. So if you aren't engaged and want to defending your industry, likely you're your business won't survive if your industry doesn't. So our whole entire family goes full throttle and tries to involve everybody with regard to defending our industry and making sure our voices count. I really appreciate your family all being involved. You guys are really the prime example of it's a grassroots organization. It's a grassroots making process. Um, and we have a chance to engage with a lot of grassroots producers, um, beef producers across the industry at the NCBA convention coming up in February in Houston. From your perspective, having seen that policy at work, having been involved with it, just give us your thoughts on that process. Well, anybody who has, has not been to a convention needs to come because if you don't believe that our policies are grassroots, come look at our meetings and come visit the committees and you can see there's debates on both sides of the issue. There's arm wrestling cha challenges going on, but the bottom line is we try to seek what our members want and the answer is whatever they send to us as policy, we carry forward to try and defend in the industry. Yeah, it's really something to see all those all those beef producers together. And I'm place. excited to be in Houston. I don't. We've never been to Houston, and uh, boy, they're rolling out the red carpet. I think Houston is going to be a fantastic, fun celebration as well. Yeah, well, I'll look forward to seeing you there. Uh, in the meantime, I think that we need to go look at some heifers in the beautiful farm here in Minnesota. Thanks for having us out today. Yeah, thanks for coming. As Don just mentioned, the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show is an event you can't afford to miss. The convention runs from February 1st through the 3rd in Houston, Texas, and registration is now open. 
go to convention.ncba.org for all the details. Each November, leaders and companies from the agricultural community come together to share information and updates at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Convention. Let's check in with Russell Nimitz, who is there in Kansas City. Well, there's no question that international trade continues to play a very important role for the overall success of the U.S. beef cattle industry. And our friends at Robo AgriFinance have just released their Global Animal Protein Outlook Report. And with us from Robo AgriFinance to talk more about the significance of that report is their Don Close. Talk about some of those highlights and why international demand is so important to U.S. beef cattle producers. Yeah, the the real backstory there is the growth we are seeing in China. We're expecting to see that growth continue in 2022, but it's not just China. You know, we continue to, Japan continues to be our largest customer. South Korea is a very close second. And as I said, China has replaced Mexico as our number three customer. So the volume and the demand for U.S. quality product going into Southeast Asia is going to continue to be a driver in our market. Which indeed is some very good news for producers across the countryside. Bringing things a little bit closer to home, domestic demand, prices at the meat case these days, consumers are starting to see food prices on the rise. Talk about how inflation could or is going to affect beef demand. I don't think, I don't think we can talk our way around the fact that inflation is front and center on everyone's mind. But if you look at where we're at with the more meals at home because of the whole COVID thing, uh, you know, we, we're setting USDA prices for October. We were at 740 on the all beef price. We're 780 on choice beef. And we think those prices are going to hold. As we see supplies contract in 2022, we're still talking the two to 4% growth in exports as we've already referenced. So as that supply tightens and we're still, we could see some shift in which items consumers are buying because of constraints on the budget, but overall beef demand remaining incredibly strong. Absolutely, and the bottom line is, whether it's demand here at home or around the world, I mean, international trade and consumers here, it really does put more money in the producer's pocket. You know, we've been the work of, of USDA, you know, US trade ambassadors, the USMEF, NCBA, you know, the, the work that has been put in by the industry to grow exports, to, and to build that relationship with China, it's, it's clearly paying dividends. And I think the, as we're looking at exports as a percent of production of, of all beef and variety meats, in excess of that 15% level, we're finally seeing a volume of trade there that is significantly showing up in cattle and beef prices. Well, as always, we appreciate you joining us here on Cattleman to Cattleman. Russell, always enjoy it. Thank you. All right. And cattle producers across the country can hear more from Don Close and all the others at Robo Agri Finance at the upcoming NCBA convention and trade show headed for Houston, Texas, February 1st through the 3rd during next year's Cattleman's College. To stay informed on the issues facing you as a cattle producer, and to help support your industry. Think about becoming a member of NCBA. It's important and easy to do. Just call 866-233-3872 or you can visit our website, ncba.org. Still ahead, we'll tell you about a great new partnership that will make it easier for producers to attend educational events. Plus, we take you behind the scenes at the Certified Angus Beef Headquarters in Ohio. Stay with us, we'll be right back.
as a stalker operator, your job is to turn forage into profit. With the right implant, you can. Revlor G improves grazing performance for 150 days, the same length as the typical grazing period. And it's dosed for stalker's maturity levels, adding up to an extra 23 pounds. See why Revlor G is the number one choice in stalker implants at RevlorG.com. A withdrawal period has not been established in pre-ruminating calves. Do not use in calves to be processed for veal. Staying on top of the latest industry, information and technology is important to beef producers. And now you can get reimbursed for attending important educational events. It's called the Rancher Resilience Grant, which is administered by NCBA thanks to a partnership between the National Cattlemen's Foundation and Cargill. We spoke with a couple of producers who recently took advantage of this great opportunity. So after I registered for the NCBA convention for the first time, I got an email um, and in that email, it was a application for the Ranchers Resiliency Grant. And I didn't, I had no awareness about the grant and was really um, excited to click on that link uh, within the email and then go through the learning models. Um, that and alone was very enlightening to me. Um, and it was really exciting to, to be awarded the grant to come to the Cattlemen's College. It is my first time attending and I've always heard about it, and it definitely did help to pay the way to get here. We had plenty of other things to spend money on this year, like everybody else. I was watching the Cattleman to Cattleman show, which I kind of do religiously, and um, they came in and had a guest speaker and started talking about the convention, which I thought, well, hey, the convention would be kind of cool, kind of neat, but I'm kind of small, just starting, didn't know if it was something for me yet. But then they started talking about the Cattleman's College and perked my ears up and I was like, wow, Cattleman's College. And I said, I'm gonna look into that. And they said, by the way, you can fill out this form and you may win a scholarship. Um, so I filled out the form, thought no chance. I don't, I don't win anything. I played the lottery, I haven't won yet. But um, called me up, sent me an email, said, you're welcome to come. And I was extremely excited about being able to join. I think there's a lot of learning opportunities. Um, and I work in an industry that really supports young beginning farmers and ranchers in education. And we believe in learning and growing. And I know that it takes dollars um, to make events like today and this week happen. And obviously the Ranchers Resiliency Grant doesn't happen um, without supporters like the NCBA and also Cargill. Um, just want to say thank you to them for allowing many, many folks to have the opportunity that we would not have normally had to attend Calumans College at Convention this year. Thank you. Joining us now to talk more about the Rancher Resilience Grant is Michaela Clauser, NCBA's Associate Director of Producer Education and Sustainability. Michaela, how does a producer go about applying for this great grant? So a producer can apply by going to ncba.org. Underneath the producer tab, click Rancher Resilience Grant. There, there will be a couple really simple steps and then a short application to fill out. So what type of events does this grant cover for somebody to attend? So this grant covers events such as the Cattlemen's College, which is the precursor for the cattle industry convention, our regional stockmanship and stewardship events, um, and then also some breed association conventions and other relevant industry meetings and symposiums. You know, with that whole gamut of industry events, uh, it's, it's so much great information. Why is it so important for producers to really make an effort to get there? Yeah, so we know that the industry is continuously changing and from every aspect, technology to policy, environmental, and some recommended procedures. And these events provide the latest information to producers to then apply back home on the ranch or farm. So you mentioned Cattlemen's College. Can you give us a brief preview of what's coming up in Houston this year? Absolutely, so we have a ton of tremendous speakers coming from all over the country to join us there in Houston. We will kick off January 31st on Monday. So we ask you guys to be there a day early. We will hear presenters from Rabo AgriFinance present on the global industry trends, as well as the UC Davis Clear Center discuss how we can de decrease our environmental footprint and communicate those efforts. A popular session is always our live cattle demonstration. And this upcoming year, we have Dr. Bob Weber with Kansas State University and Shane Bedwell with the American Hereford Association demonstrating how to evaluate cattle, both phenotypically and genotypically. 
Afterwards, we ask you guys to join us at our reception where we, where we will have fun drinks and yummy hors d'oeuvres sponsored by Certified Angus Beef. And then we'll start first thing on Tuesday morning um, where we'll have really popular topics uh, that we like to highlight every year, nutrition, heart health, risk management, and sustainability. A new track that we are adding this year is our Trending Now. We'll hear speakers present on the hot button issues such as gene editing, tech tools pertaining to grazing management, and where we are at with that beef on dairy conversation right now. And then additionally, we know that producers always relate the most to their fellow producers, and we're really trying to capitalize on that this year. We have a couple in, we have a couple of producer panels where they will discuss how to add revenue, stretch your grazing resources, and then our esteemed environmental stewardship program award winners and nominees will present on how to make conservation pay. And then we'll wrap everything up with our keynote and lunch, all sponsored by Zoetis. So we love working with those folks over there. Michaela, thanks for being here today and thanks for all you do to bring this education to beef producers. Thanks, Kate. As Michaela just mentioned, there's a great opportunity for producer education and information February 1st through the 3rd in Houston, Texas. The Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show has many educational events, including Cattlemen's College, that can help beef producers be more successful. You can get all the details, including how to register, at the website convention.ncba.org. There's always a lot of great food to be had during the convention, and the folks at Certified Angus Beef are kind enough to donate plenty of their product for events throughout the week. Black Angus has become the most popular breed in the U.S., thanks in part to CAB's marketing efforts. Brian Baxter had a chance to visit their headquarters in Ohio and see the many ways they work to promote the Angus brand. Worcester, Ohio is home to the largest and most successful branded beef program in the world. Certified Angus Beef was established in 1978 and over the decades has become the go-to beef choice for many steakhouses, groceries, and homes across the U.S. We started in Ohio mainly because that's where the producers were located that had the vision for Certified Angus Beef. We've been here ever since. It is a brand wholly owned and led by producers. Uh, it just happens to be the largest beef brand in the business. Uh, our mission today is the same as it was in the beginning and that is to create demand for registered Angus genetics. Certified Angus beef delivers consistent quality because of the rigorous standards that are required to earn the label. All beef must meet 10 quality specifications which ensures customers get the best possible eating experience. First off, the cattle have to be black, Angus genetic influenced. After the black requirement is satisfied, then there's a, a set of 10 specifications that each carcass then is subjected to. And those specs really re revolve around consumer preference, taste, flavor profile, tenderness, consistency. You know, our, our specs uh, create a product that uh, you can open one box on the East Coast or one box on the West Coast, and it's gonna be the same. So the spec that really drives the flavor and tenderness is our marbling spec. And if you look at carcasses that do not make the brand, the number one reason why they do not make the brand is because of lack of marbling. And it comes down, to, again, to, to taste. That's what consumers want more than anything, is taste. And Angus Genetics uh, have proven through science through the years that it can deliver that product. The highlight at the CAB headquarters in Worcester is the culinary center where guests get a great hands-on experience with beef. At the heart is the Meat Lab, a fully functioning butchery that teaches guests new techniques for cutting, grinding, and packaging beef. We have an actual ray where we can bring in uh, sides of beef, we can bring in uh, box beef, and basically we use it to educate any of our um, licensed partners. For instance, we could take a, um, a strip loin, and typically we'd make a, a strip loin of New York strip steaks, um, but maybe instead we could change the way we cut that and actually split it in half and make split strip um, fillets. Uh, just something a little different that you can't get everywhere that just adds a little bit more value to that particular cut. But that's just one example. We basically have uh, different alternative fabric 
fabrication methods for basically every cut um, on the carcass. Just different ways that we can make it look uh, more premium and just to help that restaurant tour get just a little bit more value out of it. The more that we actually create demand for our product, the more premiums become available for our, our producers. CAB also has a full kitchen staffed with award-winning chefs who work with restaurants and food industry professionals to share ideas for beef dishes and to experiment with new techniques and flavors. What I think is, is pretty cool about our culinary center and our meat lab is they're connected. Um, so we can actually bring in a carcass, for instance. We can break that down in front of them, show them where those different cuts come from. And then if they haven't heard of them or maybe they're interested in a cut, our chefs are the next room over. So we can actually show it to our chefs and maybe that, that chef team that's visiting us can then go work with those chefs and, and learn how to cook it differently than what they maybe have done before. So that's a pretty unique aspect of our culinary center, the interaction that we have in our meat lab with our with our chef team. The Culinary Center doesn't just work with restaurants and steakhouses, the chefs also create recipes that are perfect for home cooks, posting them to the CAB website and YouTube page. A lot of times people think certified Angus beef and you think steakhouses, steaks. In the test kitchen, our, our primary goal is to develop recipes that people can look up easily on our website that we've tested. Um, we not only test here, but we send it to home test to make sure that people can do these easily in their own home kitchens. Today in the test kitchen, we're gonna be doing the Instant Pot Classic Pot Roast. We know that not everybody out there is looking to eat uh, steaks, middle meats all of the time, and there's a lot of other great cuts out there, so we wanna really highlight the other cuts and give you an avenue in which to cook them, um, some different flavors and some different techniques. Each day, millions of pounds of certified Angus beef are sold at thousands of restaurants and retailers located in 54 countries around the world. But they know that all that success is dependent on the farmers and ranchers who produce high quality Angus beef. We talked about how producers own the brand. So the wonderful thing about certified Angus beef is there's a tremendous amount of pride and ownership in that brand, and they're doing their part to make it better day in and day out. It doesn't matter if you're in Arizona or New York or California. If you have the right Angus genetics, you can produce the right kind of high quality cattle that can meet the brand's expectations. People nowadays are really in tune with quality and they know that our brand is quality. So when they see certified Angus beef, they know that whatever cut they're buying, they're buying quality product. And the more they learn about our story, the more they feel like they can get behind that product. Reporting from Wooster, Ohio, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. If you'd like to learn more about the Certified Angus Beef brand, meet some of the farmers and ranchers that produce high quality Angus genetics, or just learn more about their programs, visit their website, CertifiedAngusBeef.com. Still ahead on Cattleman to Cattleman, We'll see how John Deere equipment is making a positive impact for one Texas ranch. Stay with us. Did you know you can get reimbursed for attending cattle industry educational events? The Rancher Resilience Grant helps cattle producers attend valuable programs such as Cattlemen's College and Stockmanship and Stewardship training sessions. Local, state, and national events qualify for the grant and successful applicants can receive money back to help cover registration fees and hotel expenses. To apply for the Rancher Resilience Grant, go to ncba.org and click on the Producer tab. Getting to run a family farm is a dream come true. When you can grow good grass, there's opportunity to grow plenty of weeds. We want to use the tools that will help us do a better job. I would like the legacy to be that we took really good care of the land and we truly did it as a passion and we did our very best for the right reasons. Rain was a big issue for much of cattle and hay country this year, but on the Texas Gulf Coast they had the opposite problem. Too much rain made it difficult to get hay up between storms. The team from John Deere introduces us to a Texas cattle producer to see how he handled a tough, wet hay season. In Bay City, Texas, the fields are wet again 
and John Reynolds' tractor and baler are spotted with mud. It's something he's seen all too often in 2021, as he and others in the area have struggled to bale the hay they need. So this year, at least on the on in, in our area on the Gulf Coast, we've had an exceptional amount of rainfall. We had 20 plus inches in May and probably equal in June and July. And uh, it's just rained and rained and rained. On a typical hay season, you would get three to four cuttings per year down here. Here we are, we're nearing the, the end of hay season. We're in the, we're in the, in the final quarter and most people are just working on their second cutting. Uh, the volume has been there uh, for the most part, but the quality hasn't. And that had to do with the rain that we've had this year. We weren't able to get in there, get the hay cut and get it dried out and get it bailed up before the next shower came along. On a normal year, I will produce enough hay, not only to feed my cattle, but also to have a reserve. And this past winter, Unfortunately, with the winter snap and whatnot, we went through our reserve. And now with all the moisture this year, it's been really difficult to, to try and get a minimum to what I need. John didn't have to worry about hay early in his career when he worked away from the ranch for a time. But in 1991, he came back to manage the operation that has been in his family for six generations. The Reynolds Pierce Ranch was um, part of a much bigger operation started by my great-great-grandfather, Abel H. Shanghai Pierce. So, so originally, Shanghai Pierce uh, saw the benefit in this area of Brahmin or Bos Indicus cattle. There had been a few imports prior, but he is best known for making one of the largest direct importations from India of Bos Indicus cattle to the United States. He saw the benefit uh, because there was quite a, a fever tick problem with the European and, and English uh, cattle that were here. And he saw that they were more heat tolerant and he uh, felt that if we could crossbreed these animals, we'd have something far superior than either parent. Today, the mix of breeds John uses has changed, but the goal is still to raise a high performing beef animal that can stand up to the Texas Gulf Coast environment. We use uh, both Simbra and uh, Simangus bulls in conjunction with uh, a terminal cross of Charlet. We went to Charlet, one, because they were readily available. Because of their uh, white or light color, they're more heat tolerant. And weight per day of age, you know, they're, they're top of the chart. And so for a terminal cross on these Semental Simbra cross females, you get an animal that, um, you know, there's plenty of milk for that animal to grow. And so with that weight per day of age, you just get a strong yearling to market. To get his cattle through cooler seasons, John depends on his hay crop. That's why he's a believer in using John Deere machinery to get the job done when the weather window allows it. What I like about the John Deere baler is its uh, uniformity and the way it, 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 it operates and, and, and creates that bale and pretty uh, operator friendly. Um, and that's important. Um, and m much like all John Deere equipment, it's, it's multiple operator uh, friendly, you know? And so that's very helpful. When John goes out to the field with his, with his 560M baler, that thing just works great. Man, he, he can really make some good bells and get that hay up off the ground in a, in a timely manner. Because a lot of times, even this past week when we were putting up hay, it rained that next evening. And uh, so there is no room for error. It, whenever, when it goes to the field, it has to work, no questions. The quality of bale I get out of that 560M baler is probably as good or has it, as it's ever been. The integrity of the bale, if you store it outside and the, uh, the able to have the integrity, be able to preserve the forage inside. John relies on the service team at Shapa's Farm Supply. That gives him a level of comfort knowing his John Deere gear is maintained and ready to go. Having the tractor inspected every year keeps my downtime to a minimum. It also enhances the life of the tractor, therefore enhances the trade-in value. I think John knows every one of my technicians back there and all my technicians know him, his ranch, and most of his employees. Whenever we have a problem, they know who to call. 
my relationship with Shoppers Farm Supply has been increasingly more and more important every year. It is a relationship because it's so important if you buy a piece of equipment that you have a dealer that will back you, that will have the parts, the service, the know-how, the techs to service it. What I like working with John and other customers of the community is I get to help those people where I came from. I grew up in the ag industry. I grew up farming and on a ranch and I did not want to leave that. Uh, but now I, I'm the one that whenever they have a problem or an equipment need, they call. Having a tractor and baler you can depend on is essential. That's especially true in a year when the weather seems to work against you. Even with all the challenges, John says he still loves carrying on the family ranching tradition. To be sixth generation um, makes me really proud. Um, hopefully there's a seventh in due time. Reporting from the Texas Gulf Coast, I'm Brad Bulla for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. If you'd like to learn more about how equipment from John Deere can bring value to your farm or ranch, visit your local dealership or check out the website johndeere.com. Still ahead on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll show you how the Natural Resources Conservation Service can help producers improve their land, even in challenging environments. That story when we come back. Get more from your mower conditioners with John Deere Zero Series Mower Conditioners. Cover up to 10% more acres per hour with the wider cutting width of the C500. Cut time changing knives in half with quick change knives. Mow with confidence thanks to our five year cutter bar warranty. Get more productivity, tractor compatibility, uptime, choices, and confidence with John Deere Zero Series Mower Conditioners. It's a big job to manage the landscape of any farm or ranch, especially when these lands are facing pressure from surrounding urban growth. We had the chance to visit a Colorado ranch whose family has a long history of implementing conservation practices to keep their lands in agricultural production. People are moving to Colorado Springs because we have this huge, beautiful mountain and big, wide open spaces. Those big, wide open spaces are managed by someone and they are also part of someone's livelihood. One of the things that makes agriculture so hard to walk away from is that these are our homes and our families, not just our businesses. You can hear in Maggie Hanna's voice that she has a strong attachment to the land her family has ranched on for four generations, but it hasn't always been easy. Nearby cities are expanding and edging closer and closer to the ranch. Another challenge here in Colorado is the huge urban and suburban growth that we're starting to see along the I-25 corridor along the Front Range. And so we're seeing what were rural communities becoming bedroom communities to the metropolitan area. The types of agriculture that we can continue to produce are affected because more and more it becomes more urban or suburbanized across the state. And what a special thing that we call home a place that other people want to call home. And I think one of the frustrating components and a component that I inherited from the generation before me was that these things both have to coexist. I can't say that the Front Range shouldn't grow, and I can't say that only ag should exist in certain places. But what I can say is that we need to do a better job of seeing each other and knowing how and where those pressures will exist and how and where we can respond to one another. Maggie's passion for protecting this land comes from her dad, Kirk, who was an early pioneer of holistic resource management, working to preserve the grasslands of Colorado from overdevelopment. I have had the unique opportunity to have a career that walks in that shadow. He passed away in 1998 uh, after serving as the um, president of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. He worked very hard to bridge the gap between agriculture and environment. I have followed in some of those footsteps um, to pursue relationships between urban and rural environments. 
conserving these places, these working lands in the state of Colorado is um, valuable, not just for protecting open space, but these are about keeping viable food production systems in place, delivering a safe product to our consumers. Ag is, has been, and likely will continue to be one of the top three economic drivers in the state of Colorado. So this is about protecting an economic piece of Colorado's infrastructure. Beyond the benefits that we can put an economic value to, we also have the ability to sequester carbon, manage our water tables in these spaces, um, and ensure that our air, water, and uh, you know, general life functions are still available to all of us. With all the talk of climate change and how agriculture needs to be climate friendly and everything else, conservation is a, a big portion of that. We're not just sustaining the landscape, but we're, we're generating it. We're, we're finding that optimum level of land management with production agriculture. As the population grows, there's more and more pressure on our agricultural producers to produce the food needed to feed a growing population, not just in Colorado, but across the country and around the world. The partnership with her local NRCS field office provides Maggie not only support of the ranch's conservation plan, but sometimes simply friendship and guidance. NRCS has been a critical component of Hannah Ranch's work since the mid-1980s in basically every aspect of what they can deliver. They have offered financial assistance and technical assistance. They have mentored generations of the Hannah family through projects. And last year we were in the midst of 18 months of really scary, dry times. Uh, and it was I was seeking counsel from uh, NRCS, but I was also, I received some comfort to know that this is not a specific ranch issue. We are in the midst of like a very scary dry time and this is how we are collectively gonna manage out of it, it was really helpful. Maggie and her family placed part of their land into a conservation easement, which allows ranching to continue, but prevents more intense development. A conservation easement to private working lands is a benefit to the state of Colorado no matter how you interact with these spaces. Whether these are places that you choose to recreate or landscapes that you make a living from, um, having a functional ecosystem that has a future and won't be under pavement at some point means that we can plan accordingly and move forward with a shared vision. So conservation in the future, it, it ties into the natural resources because it helps us function and helps us sustain ourselves. Natural resources are our, our lungs of our system. You know, it's, it's the beating heart of our land. They now have a conservation corridor uh, here in this area that has all of these farms and ranches protected adjacent to those state lands to ensure that there is agricultural land in this area for the future so that we can produce livestock and we can produce the, the food needed to, for the growing population. Maggie has also found that adopting these conservation practices has made her day-to-day -day work on the ranch easier. I can move cattle by myself. I can fix a float by myself. I can make this system function without needing a lot of additional labor. We can make these landscapes function in a way that is easy to invite the next generation back. You know, like we don't have to scare them away by having these workloads or these skill sets that are so unattainable. This is really functional. We've probably seen a change in resilience. Um, we've changed in the adaptive management. So overall, I think it's just become a more adaptive management tool that has allowed the flexibility and the foresight that uh, allows her to do other things as well as other jobs. Years of conservation planning by the Hanna family will keep this ranch as their home and livelihood for years to come. I have been given this path and I've been given this passion and I really do believe in this work. And I think as the fourth generation of this family in this place, it gives me both a lot of meaning to know that this place existed and functioned and thrived through prior generations and that I now have the opportunity for a variety of reasons to pursue that and push it to the next generation. My dad is buried here. Land is so important because it ties us to place and it creates this sense of belonging beyond just the community of humans that we exist with.
To learn what conservation plans might be viable for your farm or ranch, visit your local NRCS field staff about the technical and financial assistance they provide. Go to nrcs.usda.gov to find an office near you. Have you missed an episode of Cattlemen to Cattlemen? You can find those on our YouTube page, as well as a complete archive of all of our past episodes. So check out and subscribe to the Cattlemen to Cattlemen page on YouTube. Up next, it's time for a visit with the cowboy poet Baxter Black. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Cattle producers across the country work hard to care for their animals and their land. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is there to help. Find out how you can work with NRCS to develop a conservation plan for your operation. Find possible funding resources for implementing conservation practices or get free expert advice on ways to improve your farm or ranch. Visit the website nrcs.usda.gov today. When the field is your office, you never get tired of going to work. Cut, rake, bale, repeat. New Holland offers the power and versatility to get through the day. From small squares to large squares and everything in between, New Holland has you covered. Visit your local dealer today to find out more. New Holland. We know you're up before the dawn because the cattle rise before the sun. And you spend long hours in the saddle because the herd isn't always over the next ride. And you care for the land because you know it takes care of your family. And we know you do great work. And it's time to tell that story to the marketplace. I am I Global. I'm here to help you do just that. Did you know that Prefort makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefort Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefort makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefort Direct, visit us at prefort.com. Prefort, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. I was talking to Oki the other day. He's the farm dog. He doesn't care to go out on the range with the cow dogs. I found him down by the corral one day. He seemed to be pondering. So I asked, what are you thinking about? School, he said. Maybe going to college. <laughs> well, that was a new one for me. He never seemed to be the studious kind. Well, what would you major in? Bones, I guess. An anatomy student? Uh, maybe an archeologist, a musician? No, I was thinking about becoming a chef. Have you ever cooked anything, I ask? No, but I've eaten a lot of bones. Well, that's for sure, I said, remembering the thousands of carcass remnants that I've found on the porch. What kind of menu would you have? I mean, a bone's a bone, right? No, not to a bone connoisseur. That's like saying a rope is a rope to a cowboy. When the only caviar you've ever eaten is that fluorescent fish bait, you have a very limited sense of the bountiful taste sensations that await you. Woo! I guess you're right, I conceded. Do you actually have to cook to bone? Well, it can be marinated, you know. Served all slime rosado, sliced into bone dollars. Wow, I said, I, I had no idea. Ethnic restaurants draw big crowds, too. Look at Burger King. Well, that's not ethnic. King, said Oki, like the king of England? They dig his bones up and eat them. Well, that sounds interesting, but where are you going to get a regular source of bones? I've got a cousin in Miles City, and he said they've dug up thousands of dinosaur skeletons up there. Well, I looked at Oki. I knew he'd never make it to Montana. He won't even go to the mailbox with me unless I, unless I drive him. But I thought to myself, it's nice to know that even good old farm dogs dream big. Kind of like 
good old farmers. This is Baxter Black, an Okie from out there. This beef quality assurance tip is funded by the Beef Checkoff. Hi, I'm Dr. Julia Herman with the National Beef Quality Assurance Team, and I'm here to talk to you about building a biosecurity plan. When we talk about biosecurity, we are emphasizing keeping diseases off the operation, and this can be done in a number of ways. Cattle producers are already taking steps to keep their cattle healthy, and having a written biosecurity plan is an important part to both healthy cattle and a successful operation. BQA has developed some useful resources to help cattle producers walk through current biosecurity practices on their farm and provide steps for continuous improvement. The customizable template enables producers to fill out with a trusted resource such as their veterinarian. Our BQA Advanced Education module focuses on the principles of biosecurity and walks through the plan. These are great tools to prepare your operation for a disease outbreak and improve the success of your farm in the long term. Check out these resources on bqa.org. The Beef Quality Assurance Program is funded by the Beef Checkoff. We've gone to Texas for CattleCon 2022. The Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show is the oldest and largest event in the beef cattle industry. And we're headed to Houston, February 1st through the 3rd. The Space City is a melting pot of culture, art, and some down-home Southern hospitality. Everything's bigger in Texas, so you can't afford to miss the massive NCBA Trade Show. This is your best opportunity to network with fellow producers, learn, and simply have a blast. Engaging speakers, outstanding education, all for the beef cattle industry. So let's get back on track as we've gone to Texas for CattleCon 2022 in Houston, February 1st through the 3rd. Visit convention.ncba.org for more. Welcome back. Let's wrap up the show by once again checking in with Russell Nimitz at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Convention. Well, sustainability truly has become a very important topic for the U.S. beef cattle industry. And tackling this issue head on are the folks at the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And with us is their incoming chairman from Kansas, Debbie Lyons-Blythe. And let's talk about the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef for folks who may not know a whole lot about it yet. So the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef is six years old now. And I remember joining it uh, as a founding member, Blythe Family Farms, my operation, decided to join and focus on sustainability as far as the conversation. You know, at that time, there were a lot of top-down um, organizations pushing from the top uh, different ways to measure sustainability at the farm and ranch level. I realized that the roundtable was actually going to be a very interactive, very good group. Um, it's truly a round table, so we have members that uh, encompass the entire beef value chain. So we've got uh, farmers and ranchers, feed yard operators, um, we've got uh, packers and processors, auction market owners, and even the retail and food service people. In addition, we, we do have some non-government organizations that very much are involved in beef sustainability and allied industry. Debbie, how important is it for those different segments of the U.S. beef cattle industry to be sitting around that round table and having an open discussion on this very important topic? Well, I think it's vitally important that uh, specifically that farmers and ranchers are involved in that conversation. And it's been a real eye-opening experience for me, both farmers and ranchers uh, teaching and, and explaining what sustainability means at our level, but also I've learned an awful lot about what it means at, let's say, the, the retail level, right? So they have pressures that I never understood. It's not the consumer that started this conversation. It's activists and it's shareholders of various companies. But that doesn't make that uh, word, sustainability, any less powerful. We have got to get involved and um, the roundtable has done a great job of making sure that farmers and ranchers are very much involved in the conversation around what does sustainability mean and how do we measure it. 
And of course, the ultimate goal is to stay in business and not be regulated out of business. That's exactly right. And by being involved in that conversation and realizing that a lot of the ways that we can measure sustainability at the farm and ranch level are really best management practices, that's how we continue to make sure that we're not regulated and legislated. So conversations not only with our retail partners in the, in the round table level, but also legislators. And you said your guys' website is a great resource for folks in the U.S. beef cattle industry to learn more about the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Absolutely, and I would love to have people go and look through our website. It's beefsustainability.us or usrsb.org and look for the resources tab. We've got a couple of different tools on there for you to interact with sustainability and what that means. And the bottom line is, let's own back that term. Farmers and ranchers absolutely have been sustainable through many ways. We can get better, but we are absolutely in charge of that work. Well said, and as always, we truly appreciate you joining us here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thank you. Again, we've been visiting with Debbie Lyons' wife, the incoming chairman for the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And don't forget, registration is now open for the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Houston. It officially kicks off Tuesday, February 1st, and continues through Thursday, February 3rd. This is the place for beef producers to network, set policy for the industry, and have some fun with friends from around the country. Find out all the details at convention.ncba.org. That's it for this week's episode of Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thank you for spending part of your day with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD-TV.